We are reconvening for the final panel and the penultimate session of our Rethinking Macroeconomic Policy 4 conference here at the Peterson Institute. Uh, I already cited Barry Eichengreen's joke about putting open economy at the back of the textbook yesterday. I'll let him make his own jokes today. Um, Larry Summers will be chairing this session, and I'll turn it over to him. Adam has uh, labeled this the session of rock stars. The uh, rock star who will lead us is the paper presenter, Gita Gopinath, but that will require her to be present, and I don't see her. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Gita. So thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank Olivier, Larry, and Adam for uh, putting me on the program. It's been fun thinking about uh, what we've learned over the last decade on uh, international economy issues. Uh, there were two things I did not want to do. The one thing I didn't want to do is to be exhaustive, which is to comment on every single uh, lesson we've learned uh, over the last decade, because that would just be impossible. Uh, and the second thing I did not want to do was to, be, to make this the fourth retelling of the exact same things that's been said in the previous three Rethinking Macro Policy Conferences. So um, this is a selection of thoughts that I've had uh, based on issues that I've, I've focused on and, and you know, issues that I think haven't been absorbed uh, fully into the policy space and therefore uh, are worth uh, bringing up at this point. So I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, I've, if you've read the paper, you'll see that I've, uh, uh, you know, I've organized it around 10 remarks, so that I've not related remarks, kind of unrelated remarks, but 10 remarks. So if you do pick up the paper, you can just look at my remarks and you can then decide whether you want to go into it or not. Um, but it tells you what I think about a bunch of issues on, on, on four different areas, on exchange rate policy, on capital flow management, on protectionism, and on global cooperation. So kind of those are the four broad areas that I uh, picked to write on. Uh, and I make a, uh, a bunch of remarks within, uh, within each of those areas. So let me start with the first one, which is on uh, exchange rate policy. Um, so this, this uh, my comments here, you know, don't, I don't necessarily have inspiration from the crises, but I think are, uh, is based on uh, more recent research, research that's been done on understanding uh, exchange rates and the impact that they have on economies. Uh, but if you go back to, you know, the classic questions in international economics, I think, I guess, the first one of the classic questions would be uh, for a country, especially for emerging markets and developing countries, is whether to float or not to float, which is do you, what kind of an exchange rate policy do you want to have? Uh, how much flexibility do you want to have? How often do you want to intervene? So that's one question. Um, right now, if you look at the facts, 80% of the countries, a uh, paper that Carmen has with co-authors, 80% of the, uh, of the countries uh, are on what they call a limited flexibility arrangement. Half of world GDP, that is countries that make up about half of world GDP, are on a limited flexibility arrangement, which means that while we moved away from the corner, extreme corner of a pegged exchange rate, it's not that they've gone all the way to a fully floating exchange rate, but they're quite in the, in the middle in terms of a managed float uh, or limited flexibility. Uh, and so the question to ask is that, is that the right space to be in? Uh, uh, or do we really have to go to the, you know, what theory uh, tells us, which is to kind of go even closer to the extreme of, uh, of full flexibility? The second question, and this I think is, uh, has, been, uh, has come up post-crisis, is that is there monetary policy independence with open capital markets? So if you're not the US and if you're any other country in the world, you do care about the fact uh, that when you have open capital markets, uh, do you, as a policymaker, simply lose control of your 
uh, of how much you can control the level of demand in your economy. Uh, and uh, there is a famous paper by Ellen Ray and Jack, uh, that she gave a Jackson Hole that says that you know maybe there is not that much monetary policy independence once you've let your capital markets be open. And the third is, as a policymaker you care about, is, you know, I worry about exchange rates, but which exchange rate do you worry about? You know, so I think it has come as a default right now that uh, people care about the, their exchange rate relative to the dollar. Uh, but you could also say, well, you care about your exchange rate relative to your trading partners. Uh, do you care, you know, maybe I don't trade much with the U.S., uh, so maybe I shouldn't really be caring about my currency relative to the dollar, but I should be caring about my currency relative to my main trading partners. So the three, three comments uh, I'm going to make are basically about shedding more light on uh, these three questions in a way that I think that we haven't done uh, before. So the first thing on to float or not to float. Uh, and here I just want to highlight uh, 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 an important new idea, which is the fact that uh, you know, some of the classic arguments for gains to exchange rate flexibility don't really work in the empirical data. Uh, so the gains to exchange, so that's why I call it the gains to exchange rate flexibility are worse than you, uh, are there, than you think. So where do I come from on that? So I mean, you just go back to the classic argument of uh, Milton Friedman uh, of why is it good for countries to have a flexible exchange rate. Right, the argument there is that countries should have a flexible exchange rate because why, when prices don't adjust all the time, exchange rate movements give you just the right uh, relative price movement uh, to uh, insulate your economy from shocks. So that's why you want to have a flexible exchange rate because nominal exchange rates do for you what nominal prices don't do for you, which is prices tend to be sticky. Uh, an immediate implication of that is uh, that you're in a world where when your nominal exchange rate depreciates, it means that your terms of trade depreciates. Okay, now, I understand for most of you, but I don't remember what the terms of trade is, but the terms of trade is a ratio which you have the price of your imports on the numerator and the price of your exports in the denominator, all right? And so the idea is that when you have a weaker currency, you, your goods relative to the price of goods in world market in, of your competitors become cheaper in the sense that you get this competitiveness gain. That's kind of a bit of the underlying thinking in the whole currency wars literature. Okay, so that is a central, that kind of is the first principles of this argument of, uh, of a floating exchange rate is that a weaker currency is a weaker terms of trade. In research that I've done with co-authors, uh, there is absolutely no evidence of that being true in the data. There is a big disconnect between the terms of trade and exchange rates. So let me be very clear here. This is the terms of trade excluding commodity prices. And everything Milton Friedman said and everything policymakers should think about is the non-commodities terms of trade, not the, not the terms of trade that includes commodity prices. So once you take out commodity prices, the terms of trades for countries are very stable. When exchange rates move around, they do not move around the terms of trade. So to be very precise, a 1% depreciation of the bilateral exchange rate is associated with only a 0.1% depreciation of the bilateral terms of trade, as opposed to the Milton Friedman hypothesis, which would say that a 1% depreciation of the bilateral exchange rate is a 1% depreciation of the bilateral terms of trade. So this is telling you that that transmission mechanism simply does not work uh, in the data. And so why is that? So what is different about uh, Friedman's view of the world versus what the data seems to point at? And it's very simple. Uh, Friedman's view of the world was that when Japan sells to the US, it sets its prices in yen. When Japan sells to, uh, when Brazil sells to Japan, it sets its prices in real. When uh, Mexico sells to the US, it sets its prices in peso. Uh, uh, and in that world, that he would be right. But that's not the world we live in. In the world we live in is one where everybody pretty much in the world sells to each other and sets prices in dollars, okay? So when you do that, and when Japan sells to Mexico and sets prices in dollars, and when Mexico sells to Japan and sets prices in dollars, and those dollar prices don't move, then that ratio doesn't move. The terms of trade, which is that ratio doesn't move. And so the exchange rate 
the fact that the Mexican peso depreciates relative to the Japanese yen has almost no effect on the terms of trade in the short run, and similarly the other way around. So what does that mean then for uh, the impact of exchange rate fluctuations for countries? Uh, if you're not the producer of the dominant currency, which if you're not the US, you are not that country, uh, then it, you know, ex the export expansions following depreciations are weak. Uh, so this kind of would explain a bit of why is it that we see countries with very large devaluations and you don't see any increase in exports. Uh, that doesn't mean that the country and the companies aren't better off. They are better off, but it's all working through markups. They make higher profits, they have higher markups, but they're not selling more quantities uh, in international markets. Um, so that's one thing. So the exception here is tourism. I think everybody points to the fantastic exchange rate devaluations and the good effect that it had on Iceland, where we did we recovered very well, but that was all tourism. And tourism, all prices are sticking in the local currency, so that works exactly the, uh, you know, the Mandel, Fleming, Friedman way. Uh, but it doesn't work for most other, most other goods. Uh, so then the question is, what does this tell me about, uh, about monetary policy and optimal policy? Uh, from a small open economy's perspective, because this is ongoing research, we haven't figured all the answers out, but from we, what we do have is from a small open economy's perspective, you're an emerging market policy maker, it, the optimal, uh, optimal monetary policy continues to be inflation targeting, but it's just that you have less control of your output gap. So you continue to want to target inflation, but you are not going to close your output gap um, because of the fact that you cannot control your terms of trade. Uh, so, so the last bullet is where to float or not to float. The answer is that uh, you know, we've had arguments for fear of floating, the fact that there are you know, the, the balance sheet effects, the fact that emerging market corporations borrow in dollar terms, and because of that, uh, weakening of the currency can have negative effects, can have recessionary effects. Um, but I just want to throw out there the fact that even the, you know, the basic first principle argument for why you want to have a floating exchange rate uh, does not work for, for uh, most, countries, uh, most countries in the world. And so there is a good reason to, to, you know, to worry about exchange rate, very large exchange rate fluctuations if you are uh, especially a, uh, an emerging market or a developing economy. At the same time, I want to be very clear, I don't endorse the view of going towards a peg. I think that there are very bad uh, reasons to be at, at, a, at a, a straight peg, and we've seen that from the commodity price collapse. Countries that had a floating exchange rate, managed float, did better than uh, ones on a peg. Uh, so we would want to be away from that extreme. But, but again, just to remind ourselves that, that the full flexibility argument stands on very weak empirical grounds. Second, um, the question, I, I made this uh, claim that it's better to be on some kind of flexibility as opposed to a peg. Uh, the canonical argument for that is that it gives you monetary policy independence, okay, uh, by being having some amount of flexibility. Now, so that comes to my second remark, because there's been a lot of discussion about whether, you know, once you've opened up your capital markets, you just, it's irrelevant whether you have a fixed exchange rate or a floating exchange rate, you just give up monetary policy independence. Uh, that was a, in a very astute observation made by Ellen Ray, where she talked about uh, the existence of a global financial cycle and the fact that all capital flows to all countries go up and go down at about around the same time, and it doesn't matter whether you have a fixed or a floating exchange rate. I believe she is right in a broad, in a broad kind of a general sense, which is the fact that there are large spillovers. Once you have open capital markets, especially on uh, long-term rates, there are large spillovers, and so that's absolutely right. But just to make sure that the, kind of the pendulum doesn't swing to the wrong extreme, uh, we just have to recognize the fact that the trilemma still does live on. So what's the trilemma? The trilemma basically says that uh, you know, countries can choose to have one of the three following three, which is a stable exchange rate, open capital markets and independent monetary policy, but they can't have all three, okay? And that's still very much the case, and there are two reasons I, I strongly believe that the trilemma still exists in the sense that having flexible exchange rates, uh, even with capital accounts being open, gives you some monetary independence. Two reasons for that. One is a paper by Jay Shamba, who looks at this very directly, uh, and shows indeed that that's the case, that countries that are on a floating exchange rate or a managed float uh, have are 
more disconnected from center country interest rates, uh, and so they are less directly tied to it, and they have more flexibility. A second is a more recent paper by uh, Maury, Jonathan, uh, and, and Qureshi, who basically show that uh, even if you look at variables like real credit growth, real house price growth, real stock price growth, uh, uh, and if you look at what are the odds that you know, a higher VIX in the US will spill over into, uh, into these particular uh, uh, measures, it being on a fixed exchange rate certainly makes you more uh, sensitive to global risk, market, risk appetite and risk, you know, risk in the market uh, conditions than if you were on a, uh, a floating exchange rate. Uh, and so for both those reasons, uh, you know, gives you an argument that you, you do have some control over monetary policy and that should remain to be the, the predominant view. Uh, the third question was, which exchange rates matter? All right. Uh, and again, uh, if you believe, if you were from the old school and you think about international trade as being the way, you know, uh, the Mandel Fleming paradigm, uh, or the paradigm that was used to explain why we choose our flexible exchange rates, uh, you would say that as a policymaker, you care about your trade-weighted exchange rate. So what, what matters is not your exchange rate relative to the, the U.S., but uh, to the dollar, but, the, but your trade-weighted exchange rate. The bottom line is, again, if you look at the data and if you look at how international trade happens, it is not the, your bilateral exchange rate or your trade-weighted exchange rate that drives your trade with the rest of the world, but it is indeed your exchange rate relative to the dollar. So I have a new work on this, uh, which, is that, which shows that the US dollar exchange rate drives global trade prices and volumes. So it's a whole new mechanism of spillovers that hasn't been uh, discussed much before. Um, so for instance, the, uh, in, if you were trying to predict if, if, as a policymaker, you were trying to predict the impact of exchange rate, your exchange rate moving around on your trade prices and your trade volumes, you would do much better by having on your right-hand side a variable which is basically the U.S. dollar, your country exchange rate, as opposed to your trade-weighted exchange rate or the bilateral exchange rate, because uh, you know those would have far less predictive power in 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 figuring out impact on your inflation, on your on your on your uh, on your trade and, and on your trade deficit or trade balance. Um, what this also means, and this is a bit provocative, is, is it also means is that uh, when you have, we, we estimate that a 1% US dollar appreciation predicts a rather large negative effect on global trade, on trade across third world countries. So this is controlling for overall kind of demand and the overall status of the business cycle. Uh, that a stronger dollar has negative effects on world trade. Why is it? Because everybody who is importing is importing in dollar terms, and if, every, and if everybody depreciates relative to the dollar, then their demand for uh, imported goods is going to go down. And if that goes down for everybody, that's a decline in overall trade uh, in, in the world. Clarify. Yes. But every, by the whole, by the whole, yes, the, for the world as a whole, for us, not just the two, but yes. Using the two as a, yes. Assuming the two are representative. Yes. Assuming the two are representative, quite apart from what happens to Brazil's exchange rate or to France's exchange rate. That's exactly right. Or to their relative activity. That's right, that's right. So saying that even if the bilateral exchange rate between Brazil and France hasn't changed, you are going to have a, a reduction in trade because of the each individual, each is, the currency of each country depreciating relative to the dollar by the same amount. Uh, it is, it's correlation. It's a more of a predict, it's a, in a prediction regression. So it's not, it's not causation. Uh, because I don't believe that the exchange rate moves for completely exogenous reasons. There's usually something that moves the exchange rate. Um, and also, just to remind you that this is, the, this is quite unique to the dollar because the dollar handily beats the euro. The euro doesn't show up in, as having much predictive power for world trade uh, in any, in any uh, of these uh, regressions. Okay, so that was exchange rates. Now, moving on, I want you to now forget about exchange rates and think about capital flows. Um, so here, uh, 
th this is probably the area that's, that got a lot of ex uh, new research uh, started off. Uh, not surprising because just like the kind of the domestic finance literature was, was all uh, recharged by the financial crisis, the international finance literature was also then recharged by the financial crisis. So I want to make three points on this, and, uh, and here I'm being absolutely selective. Um, the first is, I think, one of the lessons that we've learned is to go beyond the current account. The second is there's been a decline of what's been called by Barry and uh, the original sin. Okay. Uh, and uh, the third is I'm going to talk about the consequences of low interest rates, which has been, uh, you know, which was discussed yesterday as, as, a, as probably a state of the world we're going to be in for the foreseeable future. Okay, so in terms of capital flow management, uh, we've, uh, we've certainly now completely agree that just having focused on the current account, the overall current account, is a problem uh, be because we kind of, we missed the crisis. We missed the crisis because actually if you look at, while it's true that current account imbalances grew a lot before the crisis, but it was even more stark with the gross flows. And the gross flows grew a lot uh, pre before the crisis, they've come down, that's a chart over there. Um, and those gross flows had very important implications for financial stability reasons besides you know, the straight kind of macro considerations that we think about. Uh, so that was one point. The second gross flow, which is I think a very good point made by Shin and co-authors, is the fact that it's not just the cross-border gross flows that matter, but the gross flows within the border of the, of the country, which is the fact that you know, one, of the, one of the reasons that the shock propagated so much from the US to the rest of the world, uh, to Europe spe uh, specifically, was that there were a lot of uh, uh, European banks that were based in the US that were raising dollar funding in the US and then putting that money back into uh, US uh, mortgage markets and securities. And that's something you would have completely missed if you just saw the cross-border flows. It doesn't show up in the gross cross-border flows. It doesn't show up in the net cross-border flows. But it was a big part of the transmission mechanism. So that's something that, as in terms of uh, capital flow management policy, you need to keep your, you need to keep your eye on. Uh, a second important thing is that we just have a lot more evidence that global banks have internationalized US monetary policy. Uh, we've always, you know, view this as a possibility that there is these spillovers from US monetary policy to the rest of the world, but I think we're getting much more systematic evidence, more, more better identified evidence that this is indeed the case, and I list two papers over here, but uh, I, Adam tells me that I'm actually close to like two minutes left or something, so I should move. Oh, three and a half minutes left. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little faster. I'm on my fifth remark, which is uh, the decline of original sin. So, so while my previous remark about global banks is about how the you know, emerging markets have become more susceptible to uh, uh, monetary and financial conditions in the center. Here is a fact that tells you why they've become a little more insulated from it, which is a good thing and, uh, you know, policy that one should push for, which is that emerging markets have tilted away from foreign currency, local currency debt, uh, which has then actually reduced their exposure to global risk factors. Now, just to be very clear, that shift has happened in the case of sovereign debt flows. Uh, not so much in the case of corporate uh, borrowing by emerging markets, but it's happened in the case of sovereign borrowing. And that's a good thing. The share of local currency debt uh, has gone up from around 10% in 2000 to 60% in 2013. Uh, and while we know that there are all these wonderful good effects of that particular outcome in terms of having less of a balance sheet mismatch, uh, I think another important less recognized fact is that local currency credit spreads are just much less correlated with global risk factors. So that has an additional kind of insurance property to it, which, uh, which has been good for uh, insulating these economies. And there was a recent IMF study that basically showed that this was one of the factors that explains why they were so much more resilient uh, in the financial crisis. Uh, point six, uh, this is you know, shamelessly plug my own work, uh, which is the fact that uh, you know, low interest rate environments can lead to misallocation of resources and productivity. Okay, for me, one of the most fun pictures, uh, kind of the pre-crisis state of the world, is if you look at the, the figures that I have out there. So that's the current account for three countries, Spain, Italy, and Germany. And on the right is TFP for Spain, Italy, and Germany. 
And what you see there is you see huge amounts of capital flows into Spain before the crisis. Germany sending capital out, capital outflows. Uh, and if you look at the path of productivity, you see these nice productivity gains in Germany and this declining productivity in Spain. So if anything, this, if there was ever an allocation puzzle, this would look like an allocation puzzle. Why is capital going from the country that's supposed to have the higher productivity growth to the country that's having the lower productivity growth? And so the paper that we have basically says actually the causation goes the other way. It goes from the fact that Spain received all these capital flows, but because it was in a financial system that, was that you know, had issues, uh, it got misallocated, not necessarily to the more productive firms, it got misallocated to the to, uh, firms that weren't using it very productively, and that resource misallocation generated this. So just to flag the fact that we give it, since we're battling with many different reasons for low productivity, low interest rate environments can generate that. Point number seven. Okay, so this is me being the most provocative because I'm taking on some research coming out of the Peterson Institute here. Um, Protectionism, okay, so I have, I have three points in protectionism. The, you know, we are absolutely at a point where, uh, you know, the chances of something uh, going terribly wrong with the global trade system is, is probably the highest it's ever been since the world wars. Uh, and Adam very appropriately tells me I have only two minutes, but this is an important slide. Uh, and so we're... Okay, so we have, uh, so, so there are, you know, there's absolutely the fact that, that there, uh, there are concerns about how globalization has worked and how it has benefited people. And there's uh, certainly a sense in the developed world that, you know, the prosperity of the developing countries came at the cost of, of the developed world. And so that has generated reactions in terms of, you know, maybe there's been unfair trade practices in different parts of the world. Um, and to tie it to global imbalances, uh, and while I'm completely sympathetic to the idea that global imbalances create challenges uh, and uh, you know, require being taken very seriously, I, I just want to flag that there's been a suggestion that just you know, kind of evidence of, of the fact that countries have been accumulating large amounts of reserves, which is one of the, one of the features of what, what China did pre-crisis, um, actually causally drove the current account improvements of China, right? And uh, that set of evidence, uh, you know, by, you know, there's papers by Fred and, and Joe and, uh, you know, more recently by Menzi Chin. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an insightful set of papers, but I just don't see the causal link from, uh, from reserves to global imbalances. And if we're gonna start uh, altering our trade agreements to have currency manipulation clauses, I think we should just recognize the fact that we're on. A, we're not on the. You know, we, the evidence is still to be uh, to be uh, to be determined, and especially because there are many other reasons why we could we would expect to see a link between reserves and current accounts. It's so nothing to do with it. All right. Eight. I'm just going to skip. It's on, it was on the BAT, but the BAT is not happening. So maybe I move on. Uh, point nine uh, is that I think the, that's the bigger point is that trade. I think kind of the academic research, so when we want to look at what, what should we do about, about globalization, the academic research certainly says that trade is not the main driver of earnings inequality, but I think we've done a terrible job with redistribution. Um, all right. Last, I'm on common last remark, absolute last remark. Okay, so the last remark is on, on global coordination, and I think we can have more discussions on this uh, here. Uh, but the, just the two points that I want to make is that the global coordination of financial regulation is required alongside individual country macroprudential policies. I think that's quite obvious because we have global banks. When you have global banks, you, uh, individual countries don't internalize the effects of their there's decisions on the rest of the world, and so it's important just from, a, from an externality perspective to have global coordination. Another new phenomenon that we've seen is we've seen a lot of reserve accumulation by countries, we've seen new currency swap lines, we've seen new regional financial agreements uh, that are you know, trying to provide a global safety net, and I think they're all great and fantastic, but I, for, there are two reasons for which I do not think that they're gonna substitute from having a, a, a multi you know, international lender of last resort role of the International Monetary Fund. Two reasons, one is what Eisenman and Son, and Son point to, which is that even countries that have very large amounts of, have accumulated large amounts of international reserves simply have a fear of losing international reserves. So it's not something that they're able to use 
uh, very freely in, in a crisis situation. And secondly, most of the regional arrangements and the currency swap lines kind of you know, would depend on, on national mandates and, on, and, and have the kind of lending that might not be fully appropriate in, uh, in getting countries out of uh, a crisis. So there's, I, I completely endorse the development of all these new forms of financing and the new forms of regional monetary funds that we have, uh, but they're not substitutes but complements for, for better financial health of the world economy. All right, I'm done. Thanks. Perhaps we should have allocated two remarks to each discussant, uh, but uh, we didn't. So they're all free to discuss all the remarks, uh, starting with uh, Barry Eichengreen. I think Larry, <coughs> Larry's intent must have been <coughs> for us to sit here rather than to go up to the podium. Um, I am fighting through a cold, so apologies if I sound huskier than, than usual. Um, thanks to Olivia and to Larry and to Peterson for the, uh, the conference. Thanks to Adam, even though he appropriated my one little joke about how this feels like first semester macro where you get to the open economy in the last lecture. I do think um, there's a, a rethinking lesson here that we need to better integrate the open economy uh, aspects into the other topics that uh, have occupied us for a day and a half. And moreover, this is the one panel where the developing country perspective, at least implicitly, has been put on the table. And I would have liked to see more of that, I think, in the context of monetary policy and fiscal policy and, uh, and so forth and so on. Bringing me to uh, Gita's uh, 10 remarks, uh, I'm not inclined to quibble with her choice. Uh, I think her choices are uh, appropriate, important, um, quite traditional relative to the literature. Uh, like a traditional French chef, she is guided by the classics. Um, so rather than quibble, what I'm going to do is uh, give some remarks along the lines of more research is required on most of these points. Uh, I think Gita's uh, first two or three points can be collapsed into one. See, I'm, I'm trying to help already. Um, they can be restated as exchange rate changes provide less than full insulation from foreign disturbances and may not completely offset shocks to the trade balance. Restated that way, uh, I think these are familiar observations we've known for a long time that exchange rates uh, provide less than complete insulation in a world of capital mo mobility, and that the response of the trade balance to uh, currency depreciation is subject to uh, long and variable lags, subject to J-curve effects, if you will. What Gita adds is that uh, these anomalies are easier to understand once we recognize the pervasiveness of dollar pricing. Um, dollar invoicing together with sticky dollar prices explain why the terms of trade move less than the exchange rate. They explain why the exports of other countries are not more responsive to the exchange rate. They explain why emerging markets are not more enthusiastic about floating. I buy the conclusion as far as it goes but I don't see an evaluation in, in the paper or the literature uh, of the importance of dollar invoicing relative to all the other things that can explain these observations. So I can give you a, a list of other explanations for these phenomena as long as my arm, uh, other explanations for fear of floating, for example. So more research is required. Uh, and I do not see an explanation for dollar pricing itself. Gita has an argument 
uh, to be fair in the paper, about how global value chains make foreign currency invoicing attractive. If uh, a firm's imported inputs are invoiced in dollars, it makes sense for that firm to invoice its final goods exports in dollars. This observation is hard to reconcile, though, with the existence of financial hedging instruments of the same duration as the production cycle, as the, as the inventory cycle. So I think more research is required. In addition, we see considerable variation across countries in the extent of foreign currency invoicing. People like Chin and Ito and Goldberg and Thiel show that dollar invoicing is associated with things like trade openness, the commodity composition of exports, the stability of monetary and fiscal policies, and, and financial development. I therefore wonder whether the correlation between dollar invoicing and the elasticity of exports with respect to the exchange rate, the thing that Gita is interested in, in fact reflects the effects of these other factors that show up as influences of the propensity to invoice in dollars, but may be op operating through other channels. Gita concludes that while the benefits of managed exchange rate flexibility have been exaggerated, managed floating is nonetheless the least worst option. Uh, she calls it the constrained optimum. This conclusion, though, sits uh, uneasily with the fact that we see you know, a wide variety of different exchange rate regimes across countries. Uh, there's little sign of convergence toward managed floating as I read the evidence uh, from the IMF's de, de facto indicators, for example. And why countries choose the exchange rate regime uh, they choose, a classic question in, in international economics remains poorly understood. You will not be surprised that I uh, feel compelled to uh, offer a few words in defense of the concept of original sin. I think the work that Gita cites by Du and Schreger over, overstates the, the scope of the shift toward domestic currency issuance precisely because they look at a small handful, 14 of relatively large emerging markets where the shift has been most uh, pronounced. She emphasized in her uh, verbal remarks uh, correctly and, and importantly that the shift away from foreign currency debt affects sovereign debt but not corporate debt. Another question, why sovereigns have made progress in placing home currency debt in local markets but emerging market corporations have not and continue to uh, fund themselves in foreign currency is not well understood. Charles Engel has a conjecture that improved monetary discipline has enhanced the ability of governments to borrow in domestic currency, but why their corporations shouldn't benefit from this as well isn't obvious. Galena Hale and Mark Spiegel have an argument about technological advances in financial markets that have reduced the minimum of efficient scale needed to issue in domestic currency. But again, why even large emerging market corporations haven't taken advantage of this remains a mystery. I also think there is a tension between the observation that these countries have moved toward borrowing in local currency while continuing to price their exports in dollars. Where's the hedge? Where's the natural hedge, in other words? Finally, on uh, international reserves and, and the global safety net, Gita concludes judiciously that much remains to be done central bank swaps, regional financial arrangements, IMF facilities remain small relative to own country reserves and uh, relying on reserve accumulation for balance of payments insurance is expensive. Relying on swap lines is problematic. You may have noticed that day before yesterday, China refused to renew its swap line with South Korea over the THAAD missile dispute. So people who advocate uh, swap lines as a uh, solution also need to, to recognize the, uh, the political fraught, politically fraught nature of them. Um, I would add, I would reinforce what Gita said about reserves providing even less insurance than meets the eye. Although countries accumulate them, they don't use them. 
and we don't understand uh, the reason why not. So there was this famous episode in 2008 where South Korea was crumpeting the fact that it had $280 billion of, of reserves, but then everyone in their wisdom, Korean officials in the markets and others, decided that $200 billion was a red line below which reserves could not fall and could not be used. It would be useful to have more research on this, uh, this mystery. Uh, fi finally, I know I've said that once before, the alternative of uh, contingent insurance through the IMF remains problematic. We still have this problem of IMF stigma. Augustin Karstens was supposed to be on this panel, and his country is one of three that has applied to, uh, for an IMF flexible credit line. Um, whenever I go to Asia, I ask my colleagues there, what would be enough to eliminate the problem of IMF stigma? And for you, Indonesia, Malaysia, South Korea, to apply for a flexible credit line, um, the answer without exception is nothing. There is nothing the IMF could do to solve this problem. So I think more research on, on the nature of IMF stigma and what could be done about it is called for. Pierre? Okay, so, well, first, um, thank you very much for asking me, asking me to be here. It's really a pleasure, and I also want to congratulate Gita. I think she presented uh, a very nice paper with uh, a summary of outstanding key research and policy issues in international macroeconomics. Um, and I very much agree uh, in the large with uh, uh, the 10 remarks that she made. Uh, now, what I will do in, in my own remarks is to uh, pick a few of the themes, I promise not all 10 of them, uh, and perhaps present a different perspective and also add a few, a few uh, additional points of my, of my own. Now, I'm going to start with uh, the first uh, of the three first order questions I list on the, on the slide, which is uh, the transmission, the question of the transmission of monetary policy in, uh, in open economies. Um, I think that's, uh, that's really a first sort of question. How does uh, monetary policy transmits both within and across countries is something that we're all extremely interested in understanding and knowing. Um, and in particular, how it transmits from, from the center, so here um, often means the US, to the periphery, meaning the rest of the world. And what I want to do is first is to argue that, um, perhaps along the lines of uh, Barry's remarks, that we know surprisingly little um, about this. And um, this is something that um, we, know, we know relatively little from the empirical point of view, even when we look at the U.S. itself, uh, the transmission of U.S. monetary policy in the U.S. I, I would argue uh, that um, Valerie Ramey, for instance, a very nice handbook um, of uh, macroeconomics chapter uh, a few years back that covers most of the recent developments in terms of identifying using VAR techniques or projection methods, et cetera, the way um, monetary policy transmits in the US. And even then, there is a large amount of variation. And I think at the end of the day, we must conclude that we sort of already know the answer. And somehow, when we get estimates that don't sort of fit that, we sort of keep fiddling until we find the right thing. Um, now, I would argue that in the case of the effect of US monetary policy on other countries, or the effect of monetary policy in other countries on themselves, we know even little, even less. So if consider, for instance, uh, what happens if there is an expansionary monetary policy in the US and the effect it has abroad. Is that going to be expansionary or is it going to be contractionary? Now, the, the standard theory, if you go back, uh, I think Adam um, uh, at, a, at a call to go back to sort of uh, Mundell Fleming type models or intermediate macro models uh, as, a first, uh, as a first line of analysis, if you, if you go back to that, the answer is already sort of it depends. We have expenditure switching effects and we have income effects. And so if the US uh, um, eases monetary policy, it's going to increase growth in the US, it's going to depreciate the dollar, and these two effects go in opposite directions so on the other countries. And so the effect is going to be, uh, uh, is going to be ambiguous. Um, but I would argue that um, there are a lot of um, reasons that have been brought forward in the recent literature that would lead us to be skeptical about the uh, 
a possible contractionary effect of the uh, appreciation of the foreign currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. Um, so people have been emphasizing balance sheet effects that uh, when a country's uh, currency appreciates means that somehow it might relax some collateral constraints, allow them to borrow more and expand. Or you might think about uh, the uh, surge in capital flows going from the U.S. that is now a lower policy rate to the rest of the world, to emerging market economies that might not be able to intermediate and manage these flows very well and might lead through financial spillovers to an expansionary effect abroad. Um, you can think of the role of global banks. And so there are a number of reasons, some of them associated with this global financial cycle that uh, Gita has mentioned, where uh, easing monetary policy in the US might be overall expansionary abroad, and the expansion might come through expansionary effects of appreciation of one's currency, unlike the standard expenditure switching effect. Um, now, the point here is that we don't really know. I mean, it's very hard to identify um, these effects in, in practice. We don't have good experiments. We don't have good exogenous variations. So I think the empirical record, when I look at the literature, is, is we, don't, we don't really know. But suppose it is, suppose it is expansionary abroad when the U.S. eases policy. Um, the second question one might want to ask is, well, what is the appropriate policy response at home? Do you want do you want to tighten because maybe your economy is overheating? That would be sort of the usual response, and that's, that's the argument implicitly behind uh, the flexible exchange or floating exchange regime argument. That somehow you let the exchange rate adjust, but you set your monetary policy to uh, target your own objectives. Or do you want to ease uh, domestic monetary policy because really what matters for the transmission is the spread between your own interest rates and the foreign interest rate and the appreciation depreciation of the exchange rate and you want to limit that appreciation depreciation. Again, we don't really know. We might have some ideas, but I don't think uh, we have a definite answer, uh, at least for many countries. So I would, I would argue that this is an area when we want to think about the, the debate on di dilemma versus trilemma, whether we, you know, what are the benefits of having a floating exchange rate, what are the benefits of um, having a fixed exchange rate, the answer to this question hinges upon how, how well we understand and measure the transmission of monetary policy, both from the center to the periphery and also in the own country. And here, this is sort of a call for more research. We don't really have good answers to this. Now, my next point is that uh, we live in, um, it's very clear from Gita's presentation, and I think um, um, it, it's, it's increasingly uh, obvious when we look at the data, is we live in a dollar world. We've been living in a dollar world for a long time, and we live in a dollar world on the real side. This is what Git has emphasized this morning with um, the role of the dollar in, uh, in trade invoicing and the role it has in, in trade flows. We've known for a while that we live in the dollar world on the financial side when we think about the dollar as a reserve asset, as a vehicle currency, as a currency of uh, issuance of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of foreign debt. Um, and we've lived in that world um, when I say for a long time, in a sense, what I mean by this is irrespective of the international monetary system. We lived in the dollar world when we were living in the Bretton Woods era, and we live in, a, in, in the dollar world now. So there is a continuity here that is, that is quite striking. There is one small problem, though, which is that um, the U.S. is shrinking. And so here on this graph, I'm just reporting the share of uh, uh, the U.S. In, in, in global output together with some other uh, countries, um, and from 1980 to 2015 or so, this is data, the sort of shaded blue thing at the end is projection, this is the uh, world economic outlook, and you can see that, well, it's been more or less stable uh, up, until, up until 2015, around 25%. Um, Europe actually has declined substantially in that, in that same period, but if you extend that a little bit Forward. And here, of course, you have to make some assumptions because we don't have really a crystal ball that would allow us to say exactly what would happen. But So I'm just taking the projections that CEPI has made, which are based on some convergence uh, assumptions, et cetera. But so we take them with a grain of salt. I don't think they are exactly right, but I think they go in the right direction, which is that we can anticipate some crossing at some point. And here you can see the share of uh, China and world GDP going from you know, around 10% in uh, 2015. 2015 to about 30 percent at the horizon 20, uh, 2100, um, and and so this the fact that the U.S. is shrinking here is I think an important structural transformation that colors a lot of the a lot of the things that we've been experiencing in the global economy. 
And it's a structural transformation that if it happens, and I think it, it, it will happen in some form or another, maybe China not alone. I mean, you see India on that graph as well, and that is also rising quite substantially. Um, it has profound implications for um, how the global economy is going to operate, and it's going, it's going to in, in, you know, have uh, the potential for some dramatic dislocations along the way. Uh, now, one such dislocation, I think, I would argue, is already at work. Um, the growing parts of the world, as uh, you know, a number of people have been arguing, including uh, Ben Bernanke in a very celebrated speech uh, 12 years ago uh, on the savings lot, have higher savings rate than uh, desired savings over investment. Uh, and so that translates into an increase in, in global savings, and that translates into a decline in, in world interest rates. I would argue that on top of that, the composition of these desired savings is probably more tilted towards safer kinds of assets, if you think about reserve accumulation, or if you think about uh, uh, various other frictions that these countries may experience. Um, and so we have, had ex we have experienced uh, a very strong, um, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, a very strong decline in um, real interest rates and a concomitant increase in global imbalances behind the crisis, which I would argue has been driven in substantial part by this structural transformation that, that is happening. Now, notice I'm talking about trends here. I'm not talking about shock. So this is sort of uh, what have we learned since the crisis. I would argue that here there is a message that goes beyond just the crisis. There is something that is at work that uh, goes beyond the crisis, but that also accelerates at the time of the crisis. You can see here that this sort of decline, trend decline in, in, in real interest rate, this is for the US, this is the US treasuries at various maturities, I'm gonna take that as a proxy of world real interest rates, uh, and accelerates dramatically around the time uh, of the financial crisis. All right, so initially, we have a decline in interest rate, we have some global imbalances, all of that is relatively benign, uh, and as Gita emphasized, sort of the net flows uh, versus gross flows maybe would have uh, pointed, a, a, you know, a, not have indicated any, any serious uh, dislocation uh, at that point. Um, but once we hit the uh, uh, zero lower bound, um, or effective lower bound, it's, you know, it's the, 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 the lower bound formerly known as the zero lower bound, uh, uh, the, 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 um, we, we get a composition effect that is uh, quite important. And this, uh, we, we get to uh, um, a, a situation where global demand is going to be uh, um, uh, permanently depressed as long as we are in, in, in that situation. Um, and here I want to make a second point, which is when we look at gross flows versus net flows, another of, of Gita's, uh, Gita's point, which I think is, is, is first order. Um, when we look at the overall external position of the U.S., we know, we've known for a long time since the work of uh, uh, Maria Milizifereti and Phil Lane, we've compiled data on the external wealth of nations, we know that the U.S. is what I call long risky. So if you look at the net risky position of the external position, sort of the gross risky assets minus gross risky liabilities, it's, it's, it's long risky. And emerging economies, this is the red line, are short risky. They are, they are investing overseas in, in safer assets than they're selling to, to foreigners. Um, that's the overall picture. The, there's a very important point that Gita made, which is that um, banking flows are also very important. This is overall equity, FDI. But when you look at banking flows, there are interesting patterns there as well. And what the work of um, Yun Shin and his co-authors emphasizes is, in fact, the, when you, the European banks were doing the opposite trade. During that period, they were issuing short-term claims, borrowing on US money markets and reinvesting in longer term, taking on maturity and credit risk, investing in US housing market. So you had overall the US providing sort of liquidity and safety to the rest of the world, but the European banks doing the opposite trade. And part of the crisis was sort of the unwinding of that trade. And I think that's a very important thing when we want to understand the, 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 the financial stability of the, of, the, of the system. Now, as I said, uh, the, when, the, uh, uh, when we reach the uh, zero lower bound, and at some point we get into a situation where policy rates cannot be uh, decreased further, we have uh, the onset of the financial crisis, we have a, a decline in aggregate demand, and we have uh, uh, all of the aftermath of the crisis, and interest rates remain low. The question is for how long? And so that's my next point here. I want to argue that we know interest rates are going to remain low, and we can do simple exercises. Uh, here is the uh, result of one such exercise I've done uh, with Ellen Ray, where we act as, ask ourselves, okay, well, what can we say about future interest rates? 
just by looking at the behavior of the global consumption to wealth ratio. Think about the consumption to wealth ratio as something like a propensity to consume, an average propensity to consume. And it turns out it contains a lot of information, um, sort of simple Campbell-Shiller type decomposition. It contains information either about future growth, which is about TFP or demographics, or future returns on wealth, which is the risk-free rate or the equity premium. And empirically, it contains a lot of information about the risk-free rate. And so this is what this graph is showing you. If you try to predict 10 years out the risk-free rate using the consumption wealth ratio, you're doing very well. And in this last part of the sample here, it's predicting it's going to remain low for an extended period of time. Here, we're stopping the prediction point at 2011. So that goes 10 years out to 2021. And it's predicting a rate that's around negative 2%. There are two periods in which we have this very low real interest rates over uh, almost a century here, and one is in the 30s here, and that's the time when Hansen was writing about secular stagnation, and the other time is in the 2010s here, and that's when Larry was writing about secular stagnation. And so there is, it's, it's not a coincidence in our view. These are two times when the consumption wealth ratio was abnormally low and was predicting very low interest rates going forward. Okay, so once we're at the zero lower bound and we have this aggregate recession, what's the international implication? Two minutes. We could, we could do this, yes, and uh, I, I will be done in two minutes. Uh, we could do this in, um, in a closed economy, would reach the same conclusion, but there is one key difference here, is that in a global economy, you know that aggregate demand is to be low, there's gonna be a global recession, but it could happen in many different ways. Country A could have a recession, country B could be out of a recession, country A could be out of the recession, country B could be in a recession, or you could sort of spread the pain. And what's gonna be important for spreading the pain is actually gonna be the exchange rate. And the, the, the exchange rate becomes this almost zero-sum game type instrument that allows to redistribute the size of the recession from one region to another region. And it's almost one of the, f the, that's how monetary policy is gonna work. If you're gonna be at the zero lower bound, it's not gonna be through change in policy rate, but it's gonna be through changes in exchange rate that will reallocate the global recession from one country to the next. And so that has a number of implications. It suggests that this is an environment where we can make sense of things like currency wars, which don't necessarily make much sense outside of uh, this, uh, this zero lower bound environment. It also tells us that exchange rates become somehow an anchor. They become very sensitive to changes in perceptions about where they need to be, and so you can sort of try to manipulate them. And it also tells us that current account surpluses that are generated by depreciation of your currency are a way to export the recession to the rest of the world. So now the global imbalances become a way to sort of transmit the, the negative impulse to the rest of the world. Okay, though there are a number, what I'm describing here is uh, with this trend decline in the size of the US is uh, that these problems are gonna become more acute in the future if we think that somehow the quantity of safe assets that the US or countries like the US can provide. And so what are the solutions to this, uh, to this, uh, to this problem? Well, there are a couple I can, I can point out. Um, one is uh, that you could have... One solution. <laughs> yes. One is that you could have a trend appreciation of your real exchange rate. And the trend appreciation of your real exchange rate is something that Phil Hildebrand was here yesterday and was talking about the difficulties that the Swiss had with managing their external balance sheet. That's exactly the predicament they were, they were facing. Is Either they had an appreciation of their real exchange rate or they had to take exposure. Uh, there are other implications in terms of the, the global safety net. Now, I will conclude with just one remark, and if, uh, Larry, you, you will, you will uh, I think you will want to hear this. Um, so, <laughs> um, as long as it's not a multi-part remark. <laughs> it was, it's, it only has five parts. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, the, I'm, I'm telling you that we have this environment with this uh, safe asset scarcity at the zero lower bound. There is a first order fact that we have to confront as, I think, as academics and as policymakers, is the fact that yes, we've had this huge decline in the safe interest rate, but the return to capital has remained constant throughout that period. The question is, what is that gap? One explanation is that it's risk premia. That's not the only explanation. It could be also rents. I think the previous uh, panel discussed the fact that there could be increase in competition, uh, decrease in competition, increase in concentration, uh, and, and increase in market power, so that could also be rents, or it could also be related indirectly to changes in, in the nature of technological progress. So that's what I call the triple R questions. Are we in a world in which there's more risk, more rents, 
or more robots? And I think we don't really have the answer to that question yet, but that's the first order question when we want to think about a number of macroeconomic questions going forward. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm standing in for Augustine Karsten, so don't be surprised. I look a little different. Uh, but I will take up his role of talking a little bit about what uh, the central banker thinks about some of these issues. Um, let me start by first saying that uh, this is an excellent paper. Uh, and um, basically recognizes the world is messy, right? So I think the pre-crisis consensus, uh, caricaturing it, of course, is there was a neat separation between different parts of the policy spectrum. Uh, monetary policy was about interest rates. Uh, financial stability was about capital requirements. And uh, all countries lived in their own world because we were separated by flexible exchange rates. And, and I think the post-crisis consensus is that everything is linked. Right? The banking sector is linked to the non-banking financial sector. The macroeconomy is linked to the financial sector. And of course, countries across the world are also linked. And, and to some extent, if you follow the nature of the IMF's description of the world economy, you see the changing uh, sort of view of the global economy. First it was coupled, then it was decoupled, then it was a two-paced world, and now it's, uh, I mean, a few uh, quarters back, it was a new mediocre and I think now we're back on a growth path. So uh, essentially, far more linkages than we thought earlier. Now, one source of linkage I want to talk a little bit more about is uh, the fact that liquidity, by which I mean really accommodative financial conditions, meaning low rates, uh, high availability of finance, and an expectation this will continue. Um, one source of linkage is this uh, extreme liquidity leading to leverage, which uh, through central banks eventually leads to yet more liquidity when we recognize that the leverage is significant and it cannot be allowed to play out, yet more liquidity to accommodate the leverage and we go back into a cycle. So I want to talk about this a little later, but, but right now going uh, back to the paper, um, it I think uh, verifies the, the sense that policymakers have, have had for quite some time that there are no clean policies uh, with separate effects, everything's interlinked, and there are lots of unintended consequences. Uh, and the paper doesn't make an enormous number of policy recommendations, but recognizes this in, 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 in great detail. So let me, let me talk about some of the uh, um, aspects of the paper from a central banker's perspective, an emerging market central banker's perspective. Uh, for example, the point about uh, monetary spillovers to an emerging market, which Pierre Olivier also talked about. Uh, and of course, the mantra which the IMF uh, correctly still uh, propagates is let the exchange rate adjust. And we would if we could. Uh, and what's, what prevents us from letting the exchange rate adjust fully? Well, first, there's uh, positive feedback investment. What does that mean? Uh, investors put their money in your country, they see that. Uh, when the exchange rate appreciates, they get an added benefit when taking it back into their own currency. They look like they've got wonderful returns and more money flows in. So exchange rate appreciation doesn't decrease the flow of money, it actually increases it, something that Hyun Shin has pointed out uh, quite carefully in a number of uh, in, in work. Um, and because our markets are relatively illiquid, the money flowing in can have larger effects on the exchange rate and, and that adds to the problem. Second reason is that, you know, uh, we all know the, the uh, problem with currency mismatch, but it's augmented by moral hazard. Uh, there's a sense of, uh, if I borrow in dollars at low interest rates, that's wonderful. If I can't pay it back, I go to a very owner-friendly bankruptcy court. So uh, if, uh, the dollar interest rate prevails and I can repay the money because my currency doesn't depreciate too much. I benefit as an equity holder. If I get hurt because the dollar has uh, gone through the roof, uh, 
I go to the bankruptcy court where I control proceedings, and that's wonderful for me because I still don't get hurt as much. So it, there is a sense of asymmetry here, which a number of emerging markets have because uh, bankruptcy is never so clean and fast as it is in developed countries. There's asymmetric fiscal policy. What, is that, what do I mean by that? A lot of stuff is subsidized, oil for example. Uh, oil priced in dollars. So when the dollar appreciates, gives me fiscal room, I spend it. And when the dollar depreciates, I don't have fiscal room, but I still spend it. So uh, I, I really don't have as much fiscal control, and um, large changes in the exchange rate tend to give room which isn't actually there, uh, which cannot be taken back when the exchange rate moves in the other direction. So we have uh, a problem there also uh, uh, if, if the exchange rate moves too much and is allowed to do that. And, and finally, limited monetary policy independence and credibility. One, credibility, um, if exchange rate changes translate into price changes, uh, it's not clear that uh, um, people think that we'll bring things back as a central bank. And second, there's enormous pressure on the central bank every time the exchange rate appreciates price, prices uh, uh, sort of come down, enormous uh, pressure on the central bank, even if this is seen as temporary, to cut interest rates. Inflation is low, why are you keeping interest rates high? Real interest rates, given today's inflation, is sky high. Why don't you cut interest rates? So uh, these are the kinds of problems that, uh, 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 in addition to what Gita has talked about, that emerge in, a, in an emerging market. You should let the exchange rate adjust. We're all economists. We understand that's one of the adjustment processes, and you do what you can, but it is not clean. You are in between the trilemma and the dilemma. It is a process of muddling through. Let me talk about foreign capital next. Uh, we love foreign capital. We want foreign capital to come in, but we want it to come in at the long end. We want it to be risk-absorbing capital, to finance the major infrastructure projects and, and other things that we, uh, we need financed. A lot of, of what we get is short-term capital, uh, and, uh, you know, that's fine. Uh, we'd love it to be based on, uh, on conditions locally, but these are guests who depart their countries when they're not wanted there and go back whenever the call comes from their country. And they go, come en masse and they go en masse. So it's, you're an innkeeper, you, have, you never know when your guests are gonna leave. Uh, and they don't leave one at a time, they leave together. So what you do is you build buffers. You build foreign exchange buffers when the capital flows in. It is a form of macro prudential. It doesn't have to be currency manipulation. You are building buffers because there's a lot of borrowing that's going on in your country, which means that you're at a number of disadvantages. One, you can't make full use of the capital flowing in. You can't um, use it. You have to actually send it back into low interest uh, investments. You are perforce a liquidity provider to foreign capital. So you are maintaining liquid assets in order to be able to pay them whenever they want it. And that comes at a price because you're essentially absorbing the liquidity premium. And of course, this has an impact on monetary policy, which both Gita and Pierre Olivier uh, talked about. Um, there is an additional factor which uh, is not so puzzling when you look at it from the perspective of a central banker. Why don't you use all your reserves when the time comes? Why can't you draw it down to zero? Why uh, does China, with four trillion in reserves, feel uh, uh, a little uncertain, a little discomfort when it goes down to three trillion. Now, anybody in this room would say three trillion is plenty. Uh, you know, four down to three doesn't matter. But there are two things we look at. One is the level, because we want to prevent a Krugman-style run. But we also have to worry about the changes, because the changes do reflect some sort of sentiment uh, of investors and uh, convey information uh, to investors in general. So too much of a drawdown in too short a time is something that is very worrisome. And so you're, you're in a sense, once again, trapped. Uh, you have to worry uh, about these, these changes and you can't allow too much. So um, the, the point, uh, the point, uh, um, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, comes from all this is, uh, is there are spillovers, these are significant. Uh, there are no policy interventions that will lead back to separation easily. 
we have to understand that uh, any policy will have uh, larger effects. Um, for example, on exchange rate flexibility, we know we don't want to stand in the way of longer term adjustment. But to some extent, the muddling through option is to try and intervene to prevent short term fluctuations. Uh, so one of the questions I have for Gita is, uh, is what horizon do you look at these exchange rate movements? Uh, and it seems to me strange that somebody who's sitting on tons of profits from exports doesn't at some point, or, or sitting on uh, a reduction in quantities on imports, doesn't at some point make the adjustments in prices. But it, it may be a question of horizon also. Um, the, the point here, I think, really is that uh, the clean theories uh, uh, don't really um, sort of uh, aren't easy to implement policy-wise. And really what you, <clears throat> what you have a, as a policymaker is muddling through. You're trying to muddle through a little bit of this, a little bit of that, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's what we do. There's a wonderful book uh, that's coming out by Atish Ghosh, Jonathan Austria, and Qureshi, and they haven't paid me to advertise it, but it's a good book by the IMF on managing capital flows. And I think what you get from it is basically muddled through. Let me end with uh, one last point, which is um, not so much on the international, there is some aspect to that, but uh, it's also on the domestic, which is in Gita's paper, monetary policy largely, um, I think, uh, uh, is taken for given. And uh, I want to ask a few questions about that. So, so an acute form of separation I think few central bankers have this anymore, is to argue that monetary policy had nothing to do with the crisis, that the crisis happened, it was those damn bankers, and monetary policy did what it had to do. A less acute form is to argue that even if it had mild effects, these can be eliminated using macroprudential regulation. That is, you achieve separation once more. And I think the problem with this, this view is that ignores the effect of easy liquidity on leverage. And I think the point that uh, Jeremy made uh, in, uh, in one of his talks, that uh, a lot of the macroprudential works in the banking system, but monetary policy works on the entire financial system. And you don't have as much control of, over the non-banking system. And in that case, uh, perhaps monetary policy comes back the, the larger problem, and this is the point I was trying to make earlier on, is that we have in the current system a bias towards excessively easy monetary policy. It's too easy in the boom because we don't know what a boom is and we, can't, uh, we don't know what a bubble is, we can't sort of prick it. And it's too easy in the bust because at that point we are trying desperately to raise inflation below, uh, uh, be above uh, its current levels. And, and I think this, uh, the desperation to do something is accentuated with the fact that inflation targeting came in when the problem was getting inflation below the upper bound. But really, we didn't think too much of what would happen if inflation was below the lower uh, uh, bound of the target, uh, where, where we had a minimum inflation mandate. And clearly, we know a lot about bringing inflation down, not so much about pushing inflation up. And the problem then is, if we don't have much success in pushing inflation up, there's the pressure to get increasingly aggressive. And there is a perception this has no adverse effects. But if we are maintaining excessive liquidity, inflation may not budge, but leverage budges. The one thing that's absolutely clear post-recession is that leverage across the world continues to go up. And so the worry is we're in a cycle in which this doesn't actually get interrupted. And the question I want to ask uh, at the end, I don't have an easy answer, is what should central bank mandates be if they have better traction against high inflation than low inflation? And monetary policy does influence financial stability, and you can't bring back the separation by saying macroprudential as loud as you can. And uh, the last uh, uh, point I will, I will leave it at is, is there a possibility that without changing central bank mandates, uh, perhaps some rules of the game on what is uh, appropriate central bank instruments might bring back some coherence between uh, central bank policies across countries and also within country? Uh, that's a question. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Carmen. Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for, for inviting me to this, this fascinating panel. I, uh, as last speakers, what I'm going to say, much of it, you have heard parts of it uh, before from the pre previous speakers, but I'll try also to add some nuances and uh, differences uh, that I think are important. I'm going to first comment directly on uh, some of the points Gita has made in, in what I think is, is a very uh, um, forceful paper in making us think about big, the big agenda uh, in international macro. Um, and some of my comments will be nuances or additions or, like Barry said, areas for further research. Others I'm going to uh, 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 perhaps challenge. Um, and then I'd like to conclude with adding an 11th element to that 10 uh, item list that Gita has uh, put for us that actually follows on a lot of Pierre Olivier's uh, remarks uh, earlier. So on exchange rate flexibility, um, uh, Gita did mention that in some of my recent work uh, with, with Ethan Ilsetsky and, and Ken Rogoff, we point out to the very pervasive uh, practice of limited, fairly limited exchange rate flexibility as a, as a dominant um, as a dominant exchange rate arrangement. Let me also follow in what Ragu we just heard Ragu say. Uh, some of the shifts that seem to have taken place in the last decade are less, there's l comparatively little flexibility vis-a-vis -vis your textbook floating exchange rate. Uh, but let me say that there's a lot more de jure flexibility, meaning that countries are not pre-announcing. There is, seems to be a shift towards more discretion. That is, you have a managed float with unknown parameters as to when exactly you're going to intervene. Uh, and when you're going to abstain. There are actually plenty of crawling pegs that you trace the exchange rate and it looks like a crawling peg, but it's not pre-announced. So it has the advantage that you can change the rate of crawl, you can tolerate deviations. In other words, I would characterize it as yes, we have a lot of very limited flexibility cases, but one in which a lot of the corner textbook cases of fix, fix versus flex, flex are being uh, avoided, and I think avoided for good reason. Um, let me also highlight that one of the reasons we've seen the world as a whole shift towards less exchange rate flexibility is not just about emerging markets, but also has to do with Europe. Uh, the IMF, for reasons that I do not understand, uh, classifies your, every Eurozone country as having a floating exchange rate. Now, we're not here to debate <laughs> that the Euro floats, the currency floats, but that Portugal does not have a floating exchange rate in that I think few of us would argue Portugal has independent monetary policy. At the beginning, when the euro was introduced in 1999, the IMF classified the eurozone countries as having no independent currency of their own. Sometime along the way, that classification shifted, and they're now all magically floating. In our own classification, we do not uh, pursue the uh, floating uh, the, the floating label for, for Eurozone. So Eurozone does contribute to the uh, count that suggests that limited flexibility is, is, is a dominant exchange rate arrangement. Let me move on to some comments on the 
dilemma versus trilemma that that have been raised in the paper and discussed by by the uh, previous speakers. Um, in think of the triangle, you have independent monetary policy, you have perfect capital mobility, uh, and you have fixed exchange rate. Those are the three endpoints of the triangle. Uh, I would suggest that maybe it's time that we recast what we call perfect capital mobility as something much more general. Uh, what do I mean? Uh, perfect capital mobility conjures visions of capital controls or no capital controls. Uh, I think the scope for independent or some independent monetary policy in a lot of the emerging markets comes not just from capital having or not having capital controls, from the fact also that assets are imperfect substitutes and that there's many markets are illiquid in effect for an emerging market that has very limited liquidity in its foreign exchange market, that acts like a capital control because entrants don't go in in the first place. And we see this in crisis episodes all the time. Which are the markets that are the natural hedges? Uh, the liquid markets, uh, the Hong Kongs, the Brazils, Mexico, uh, Israel, these are liquid by emerging market standards and, and so, I would like to, in Gita's agenda of recasting some of the questions, uh, rethink that trilemma also in terms of not just capital mobility, but capital mobility slash asset substitutability. I do lean towards very much Raghu's interpretation of the dilemma versus trilemma. I think it is still a trilemma over certain time horizons. Not every central banker can be wrong in believing that sterilized intervention works at least uh, over certain time horizons, which again argues that over the short run there is some uh, uh, monetary uh, policy independence. Let me move on to the next item. Don't worry, I'm not commenting on all 10. Um, the I found, this is perhaps my single biggest criticism of the paper, too victorious a tone, and this I share with uh, Barry, uh, too victorious a tone that emerging markets have conquered uh, their uh, original sin. Uh, Barry has already listed a number of reasons why that statement, I think, perhaps overstates reality. Um, let me put it to you. Uh, the in the old days, so to speak, domestic debt was domestic debt and foreign debt was foreign debt. And domestic debt was issued in domestic law, denominated in domestic currency, and held by residents. That was domestic debt. Foreign debt, conversely, was issued under foreign law, linked to a foreign currency, and held by non-residents. Those lines are blurry. Uh, there is a lot of participation by foreign entrants into domestic debt markets. Um, a lot of the domestic debt, in effect, that's being issued by corporates especially is linked to a foreign currency. Uh, so none of that, by the way, shows up in many of the official numbers. So the official numbers that separate out and say, okay, here's public sector debt, here's external debt, here's domestic debt, uh, do not uh, uh, reflect the fact that much of the domestic debt uh, that is being issued, uh, even some of the domestic debt of the public sector, is linked uh, to a foreign currency. In effect, the teso bonos, the Mexican teso bonos, uh, famous of 1994-1995, were technically classified as domestic debt by the World Bank uh, because they were issued under the domestic law, but they were clearly uh, foreign currency debt held by non-residents. So I, I, I agree with Barry that it's too early to call victory uh, over original sin. Uh, on the low rate environment, um, I will take this opportunity to advertise that since 2011, I have been writing papers uh, saying that low rates are likely to remain low 
for an extended period of time. Uh, and what were my arguments back in 2011? Well, we have low rates apart, and this is not, and I'm not saying this because Larry's sitting at the other end, apart from secular stagnation, apart from saving gluts, we have low rates because policymakers in the major central banks uh, and regulators in the world's largest economies have decided we need low rates. And part of that combination of a large footprint of the official sector, i.e. central banks, and uh, m m heavier regulation, which I have placed under the broad umbrella of financial repression, is uh, an outgrowth of the fact that advanced economies also are highly leveraged, highly indebted, not just the public sector, but the private sector as well. And what, it, what can be more risky for financial fragility if both public and private sectors are highly leveraged? Well, interest rate spikes can go a long way towards generating uh, a lot of financial fragility. Let me move on to my last point on, on comments on Gita's on the global imbalances and the interrela interrelation between uh, uh, global imbalances and current account and reserve accumulation. First of all, I would love the term global imbalances to be uh, modest proposal to reconsider. We, so the U.S. has a big current account deficit. And over the years, that big current account deficit has been with various trading partners, but that's basically the bottom line of your global imbalance. Uh, for a lot of the reasons that uh, Pierre Olivier uh, also has uh, alluded to. So uh, what do I take issue? I think we may not know a lot about the link between global imbalances and reserve accumulation, but, but I think we know more than uh, uh, more than uh, perhaps the Gita's paper reveals. I think on page 17 you note that, yes, reserve accumulation was big for, for uh, China, big for Korea, but look, Germany has major surpluses but no reserve accumulation. I would argue that is not the case. That is target two. Uh, international reserves, as reported by the IFS, do not report uh, the target two balances which reflect within Europe capital flows. And that's the big story for Germany. Inflows from the rest of Europe, no, not inflows from outside of Europe. Okay, finally, to conclude, um, what is the 11th item that I'd like to add to Gita's list of 10? Uh, I think Pierre Olivier's presentation and his discussion of the modern day Triffin dilemma uh, is an excellent starting point. Um, China's role in the global economy, we know full well, has uh, expanded. It is currently second in terms of the share of its GDP and quickly moving to first. Uh, what we know very little about is global financial linkages. Uh, those global financial linkages between China and its trading partners have grown enormously, but the documentation has sorely lagged behind. And how is this connected to the Triffin dilemma? Well, you go back to the tail end of the uh, uh, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century when the dollar began to overtake the British pound as the reference currency. And one could almost monitor the gains that the U.S. was making, the inroads in the global economy because bonds, in, first of all, the, the data was pretty transparent in those days. The bond issuance denominated in dollars versus denominated in UK pounds, that was measurable, that was visible. Um, and in general, uh, the ability to monitor the overtaking 
the switch from London to New York was easy to see. We are seeing a, a switch, but we're not really measuring it. Let me just conclude by being specific on those points. You go to the BIS data, and a lot of the lending that China is doing to, um, it, it, to uh, emerging markets is not in the form of BIS bank loans. So those do not show up in BIS data. It is also not that countries are issuing bonds. It's not bond debt. It's not commercial loan bank debt. It is lending often from official or semi-official development institutions to a range of countries. Um, okay. And those flows are very opaque. Um, lastly, on opaqueness, central bank credit lines. Argentina, Brazil have had major credit lines. Quantities unknown. And finally, no. I would ask you, yes, finally, finally. No, Everybody no, no. else had their finally. Finally, you how many four. of you know, how many of you know what share of those, those loans are now in arrears or in default? We don't know. So big, big imprint of, of China's in global finance, poorly documented, good agenda for research. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one question, uh, uh, slightly compound question, but not too compound, of uh, Gita. And then we'll throw it open for a few. And we'll throw it open for a few minutes. Um, I thought there was one blockbuster observation in this paper, maybe in part because I didn't know it before and I should have known it, which was the set of observations around the non-responsive exports to depreciations and the centrality of the dollar to the whole system. What? I heard you say, in essence, was that if you took out if you took out commodities and you took out tourism and you oversimplified a bit, it was as if everything in the world was priced in dollars, and so when the dollar went up, and so it was all like a euro meeting, euro area meeting. All the countries spoke all the countries don't speak English, but the English was the language anyway, and so when the dollar went up trade between two places that had nothing to do with the dollar went down and it wasn't particularly worth you didn't get much out of depreciating your currency because it was all going to be priced in dollars uh anyway so that, that's kind of what i heard and i had a few reactions one is i was kind of stunned and maybe he wants to comment on this that ragu who it i'm gonna be unfair ragu but it seemed like every month when you were the governor of the Central Bank of India, you complained that the Fed wasn't paying enough attention to its global, to its global interests. When the, Fed raised, when the Fed raised rates, you didn't like it. When the Fed cut rates, you didn't, you, you didn't like it. So I was surprised that you didn't see evidence for your view that the whole thing was excessively U.S.-centered uh, in all of this. But I guess my question was... Um, what about the slightly more medium run implication of all of this? That is, if it's really true that everything's kind of priced in dollars and so I don't sell more, my profit margins should go way up, as you said. And if my profit margins go way up, shouldn't I like expand my business a ton in order to uh, sell more? And shouldn't that have a set of implications and shouldn't there be a set of implications of the distribution of income and shouldn't the world take a much larger interest in kind of what's happening to the dollar exchange rate if this is really what's determining how much openness and trade there is um, between uh, unrelated uh, B between unrelated nations, <coughs> finally, and you kind of hinted at this, but you didn't say it quite as directly, um, if when you depreciate your currency, you don't export anymore because it's all priced in dollars anyway, 
why should the Peterson Institute give a rip about your manipulating your currency <laughs> downwards because it doesn't translate into more exporting unless all the U.S. firms are, are really just jealous of the extra profits that the firms in the countries that are manipulating downwards have. So I guess I kind of welcome more big picture thought on what this view of yours means about how the world works. Okay. How many minutes do I have? Three. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you. Um, kind of Larry highlighted the, uh, you know, Barry was very nice, but then he said that we've had these facts and we've had explanations for these facts and what's, are you putting another, fa another explanation on the table? And the answer is no. There are some facts that we did not have. For instance, the dollar centrality. Why does the dollar show up uh, as exchange rate? If you look at the trade between, again, Mexico and Japan, why does the exchange rate of Mexico relative to the dollar dominate the exchange rate of the, of the, of the Mexican peso relative to the, um, relative to the yen? And so we do not have that fact. And this is a new fact that comes from thinking of it through the lens of, of, of the dollar pricing world. Um, and secondly, the, the, you know, the, the J curve is, is completely wrong for reasons that I can't go into right now. Um, so to, to Larry's questions about, uh, about uh, you know, what's so, so it, you know, why is it still very much the case that countries, at least prefer, at least in their state words, prefer to have a, a weaker currency than a, a stronger currency? At least uh, most of the emerging markets in developing countries do. Um, and there is, that argument still remains. So the, a simple way to think about it is that in the old school way of thinking, when you had a weaker currency, two things happened. You exported more and you imported less. Uh, in the new, in this particular dollar pricing paradigm way of thinking of the world, you basically lose one of the two. You don't necessarily export more, you might even export a little less, uh, but you certainly cut back on imports. So you still get the expenditure switching on the import side, which is that when your currency weakens, you still have a, a shift uh, in demand away from imported goods towards domestic goods. So it, the direction of it in terms of saying that you would like to have a weaker currency still works is just not working through the big uh, export margin. On the profit margin part, so yeah, I, I, I mentioned that. And also, and also the exchange rate works for tourism. So if you think of tourism as a big part of your economy, that's fantastic. Um, on the profit margin piece, you Yes, so you have an increase in profits, but I just want to emphasize the fact that this is not a huge increase in profit margins. Why is that? Because there is a reason why, uh, why firms are choosing to price in dollars, and one of the reasons they're choosing to price in dollars is because they use imported inputs for their production. So when they use imported inputs for their production and those imported inputs are priced in dollars, your profits do go up, but these are not, you know, the, the explanation is not going to be that you have these massive increases in profits. Uh, but, but I will agree with what Larry said, which is that, yes, it should expand business sell more. So we have to figure out how exactly does the second channel work. And we really don't have, uh, we, don't, we don't understand that fully, and that I'm going to leave for uh, future research. So, um, and I do think that uh, people should pay you know, more attention to the dollar's role in, uh, in international trade. I think that was a big point of, of, of writing this. Um, uh, and uh, and I hope I hope they do that. It's clearly a, a big part of expanding international trade. Um, and, and to the, you know the question about why does the Peterson Institute care? It goes back to my first answer, which is that you still do care because you have the import ma margin uh, on which you you benefit. Uh, why don't we take a two or three questions and then take responses uh, from the panel? And could Adam instruct me on how long he'd like this session to go? Joe. Oh, sure. Uh, Joe Gagnon, Peterson Institute. Uh, the question, question and a comment for Gita. The, the question is, I think that this the work that you've done on the uh, invoicing and, and uh, uh, invoice currency is really a breakthrough in terms of expanding what people used to have before. But my question is, it, it, my understanding is it's pretty much a very short run uh, fixity that you're talking about, the sort of contract of of a trade that in three or six months will be renegotiated. 
uh, do you think that these effects, like how much of the effects that you're talking about today in your paper uh, are really based on very short run correlations that over time go close, move closer to the conventional wisdom? I think the conventional wisdom is for most countries, import prices move by half of an exchange rate depreciation, and for the US, maybe a quarter. Uh, and that's just general, irregardless of, of currency of invoicing. Once the invoicing uh, you know, expires and they renegotiate, that's what I, I think people find. Are you finding something different? Uh, and, and if not, how does that change what you said? And then the comment is you did mention some of the work we did. I just wanted to say that we, for the record, we were very concerned about the whole question of causality. I think China obviously didn't intervene to push its currency down to get a surplus, what happened was they got a surplus from industrial development and they had to intervene to maintain their exchange rate. Uh, we believe that if they had let the exchange rate appreciate and not intervene, they couldn't have had such a big surplus. But importantly, just for the audience, um, we used instruments that completely screened out countries like China. If, if you intervened, countries that had intervention for stabilization of their exchange rates are not in our sample. Basically, I mean, they're instrumented out. So China has no effect on our results. Other? Uh, Gita. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, so the horizon that we're looking at is uh, up to two years. So this is not three to six months. Also, to be very clear, you know, when we talk about exchange rate policy, when we talk about the Mandel Fleming paradigm, these are all in the in the in the time horizon when prices haven't adjusted. So we're not playing a different game from that. So this is if we if we think that monetary policy has an effect, and if we think that exchange rate policy has an effect, it is all in the in the in the short run, setting aside the the comments that came up uh, yesterday. So you know, this is this is about all of the exact same issues that we 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 care about. So the, the horizon is two years. Uh, now again, just just to, to be clear, exchange rate pass through is 100 percent. It actually in in, for, in in the data we have for import prices for for, for countries except for the U.S. In, uh, exchange rate pass through is 100 percent. But that is the the issue is whether exchange rate pass through into the far into the export price in the foreign currency. That's close to zero. That's where the difference is, uh, and that's true in the data for horizons up to two years. Uh, and yes, I I wasn't trying to be too harsh on your on your work over here. I was just flagging a broader concern. Well, um, I apologize, but since we did give our, our rock star jam session a chance to riff as much as they did, I'm afraid we are out of time because we have to give Larry and Olivier the last word. So let me just say, Gita is welcome anytime to come back here and have a no more on any of these topics, but particularly to have a debate with Joe and Fred and whoever else. I think we're, as Larry is aware, we are, I have a lot of faith in my colleagues' work, but we are not uniform on this view within the Institute, and we welcome alternative views. Uh, with that, I don't mean to usurp Larry, but please, on behalf of the Institute and all of you, let us thank Carmen, Raghu, Pierre-Olivier, Barry, and especially Gita. Thank you very much. <laughs>